Chapter Twelve of Divers Women by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Buckwheat Cakes. It was a little house and a little new family, just two of them, and just six months since they were made into a family and set up housekeeping. As a matter of course, everything in the house was new also. One may prate of antiquities and the associations clinging about them that rendered them beautiful, but, after all, every couple will always look back with delight to the time all their surroundings were fresh and pretty, yes, even though they were not pretty. There is a charm in a new pine table or a bright new tin pan. This house was a little gem, from the delicately appointed guest chamber to the cement-lined cellar. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Thorne sat at their breakfast-table sparkling with new china and silver, in a dining-room so cheery with pretty carpet, plants, singing-bird, warmth and sunshine, that the beggar-girl who peeped in at the window might well wonder if heaven were nicer than that. The coffee-urn sent up a fragrant little cloud as Mrs. Thorne turned it into delicate cups with just the right quantity of cream and sugar, so that it was just the right color that coffee should be. The steak was tender and juicy, the baked potatoes done to a turn, and yet there was a slight cloud hanging over that table that did not come from the coffee urn. "'Joanna does not understand making buckwheat cakes very well, I imagine,' said Mr. Thorne, eyeing the doubtful-looking pile she had just deposited on the table." "'Joanna did not make these. I made them with my own hands,' responded Mrs. Thorne. Said hands were very white and small, but truth to tell, they were not much more skilled than were Joanna's. "'Then it must be the baking that spoils them,' Mr. Thorne said. "'Why, Philip, how do you know that they are spoiled? I'm sure they look all right,' said his wife." "'That's just where you and I do not agree, my dear. They are white-looking. They ought to be a rich brown.' "'Whoever heard of brown buckwheat cakes? They are always very light-coloured. "'I beg your pardon, but they are not as far as my observation goes,' said her husband. "'Then these are thick. They ought to be thin and delicate-looking.' "'You are thinking of something else, Philip,' said Mrs. Thorne patronizingly. Buckwheat cakes never look differently from these. I have noticed them a great many places. You never ate them at my mother's, or you could not say so, my dear. Mrs. Thorne stirred her coffee vigorously. Was Philip going to turn out to be one of those detestable men who always go about telling how their mother used to do? My mother, as if there was no other mother in the world that amounted to anything." I always have noticed, she said, that a person imagines, after being from home a few years, that there is nothing quite so good as he used to get at home. Even the very same things never tasted quite as they used to. The reason is plain. Taste changes as one grows older. This very sage remark was just a little annoying to Mr. Thorne. He was ten years the senior of his wife, and did not like allusions to growing older. "'No one need try to convince me,' he answered quite warmly, "'that I shall ever cease to enjoy the dishes my mother used to get up "'if I live to be as old as Methuselah. "'She is the best cook I ever knew, and she never made cakes like these.' "'My mother is a pattern housekeeper,' said Mrs. Thorne, "'with a little flash of her blue eye, "'and her cakes look precisely like these.' The proof of the pudding is in the eating, you will admit, I suppose. Joanna need bring in no more cakes for me. They have a sour, bitter taste, which is decidedly unpalatable. And he arose from the table, passed into the hall, and out of the front door without his usual leave-taking. Satan once worked immense mischief by means of an apple. Now he must needs come into that pretty dining-room and hide in a plate of buckwheat cakes the first approach to a quarrel in this household, and the first buckwheat cakes of the season. The truth is, when Mr. Thorne had said the day before, what if we have some buckwheat cakes, that Ruey did not feel all the confidence in her ability that her answer implied. But then there was her recipe book. They could not be difficult, she reasoned. 
The recipe said, Mix warm water, flour, and yeast, and let rise until morning. These instructions she had faithfully followed, and here was the result. Ruey Thorne, unlike some young wives, did not think it interesting to profess utter ignorance of domestic matters. On the contrary, she had an ambition to excel as a housekeeper. She had a general knowledge of many things, but every housekeeper knows that practice only brings perfection. It is one thing to watch Bridget making bread a few times, and another thing entirely to make it one's self. So much of Ruey's knowledge was theory, not yet reduced to practice, that she imagined herself much more skillful than she really was. Consequently, she did not claim her husband's forbearance on account of inexperience. Philip was not rich, and she had a desire to be an economical wife, so she did not employ an experienced cook and chambermaid, but tried to accomplish it all by the aid of a raw German girl. "'Of course I shall want to direct all my work,' she had remarked with housewifely pride. If Philip had only understood it all a little better, he need not have brought out his mother's veteran cakes in such cruel comparison with these very young ones. That day was not a very comfortable one for either of them. The blue eyes flashed out a tear occasionally, and she told herself, "'Who would have thought that Philip cared so much for eating? His mother's cakes, indeed! As if anybody could equal my dear precious mother in anything!' While he told himself that he wouldn't have thought Ruey would have flashed up in that way for so slight a cause, and to him, too, humph! He would just like to have her taste his mother's cakes. It would open her eyes a little. Later in the day they told the same parties, I'm just ashamed of myself that I got spunky about such a little thing. I wish Philip would come. I'll have muffins for tea just to please him. I know I can make muffins. And, poor little Ruey, I went off like a bear this morning. I must hurry home. I'll just step in at Bernard's and get that little panel of lilies for her. So the muffins and lilies were laid, peace offerings on the domestic altar, and the skies were clear again. The next morning Ruey betook herself to her neat little kitchen to reconstruct those cakes. She would see if it were not possible to suit her husband in this. Let me see, he said they were too thick. I will thin them then. He said they were sour and bitter. Sugar is sweet and ought to remedy that. So in went the water to thin them and the sugar to sweeten them. He said, she further mused, that they ought to be brown. Brown they shall be if fire will do it. So she proceeded to make a furious fire in order to heat the griddle. Now, she said to Joanna, carry in the coffee and chops, then come and bake the cakes. The husband and wife were engaged in cheerful chat when the first installment of cakes arrived, a few crumpled, burnt scraps of something. "'Why, what is this?' said Mr. Thorne. "'Cakes!' said Joanna triumphantly. "'She fixed em, pointing to Mrs. Thorne. The two looked at the cakes, then at each other, and broke into peals of laughter. "'The griddle must be too hot,' said Mrs. Thorne, and she vanished into the kitchen. She scraped the smoking griddle, and washed it and greased it, then she stirred the grey liquid and placed two or three spoonfuls on the griddle. Then she essayed to turn them, sticking plaster never stuck tighter than those cakes adhered to that griddle. She worked carefully, she insinuated her knife under just the outer edge of the cake, then gradually approached the centre, but when the final flop came they went into little sticky hopeless heaps. "'They are too thin,' she ejaculated. "'Joanna, bring flour. Now we shall have it all right.' Then another set took their places on the griddle. These held together, they turned, triumph at last. But they did not look inviting. Mrs. Thorne tasted one. She then made a wry face. "'Joanna,' she said with forced calmness, "'you can throw this batter away.' Then she went back to the dining-room, looking very hot and red, and said meekly to Philip, "'The cakes are a failure this morning. We will try it again to-morrow.' Philip, who had lost himself in the morning paper, roused up to say, "'Don't trouble about them any more. We have enough else that is nice.' 
the cakes will be all right another time philip there was a mistake made they were too thin this morning mother never makes them thin philip looked as if he would like to say i don't care what your mother does my mother's cakes are nice and thin and can't be beaten but he didn't mrs thorne had no intention of abandoning buckwheat cakes as a failure not she it was not her way to give up easily and yield to discouragement difficulties only strengthened her determination to conquer i'll see if i am to be vanquished by a buckwheat cake she said studying her recipe book that same evening i shouldn't wonder if there was not yeast enough in those others she said as she mixed some fresh batter and added an extra quantity of yeast keep them warm while rising the recipe read she placed them near the register near the dining-room, and retired with a complacent feeling that now all the conditions had been surely met. The total depravity of inanimate things! Mrs. Thorne had reason to believe in that doctrine next morning, when she entered her dining-room and found a small sea of batter on her carpet, surrounding the pail and widening in all directions, though this stuff could hardly be called inanimate it oozed from under the pale cover in a most animated manner. "'It is light, at least, that is one consolation,' said Mrs. Thorne, trying to be philosophical as she ruefully surveyed her carpet, then hastily calling Joanna to clean it up. Philip should not see that. When the cakes were brought in this morning, Ruey cast a little triumphant look at Philip. By dint of a hot griddle and much grease, they had a streak of brown here and there." horrible exclaimed mrs thorne after her first mouthful these cakes are sourer than vinegar philip should not be the first to speak of any lack as if she were not supposed to know more about such matters than he what does ail them i'm sure i made them exactly right this time i must tell joanna to put some sugar in them my dear wife if you will allow me i would suggest soda instead of sugar really responded ruey her pride touched in an instant there it was he actually thought he knew more about cooking than she did and pray how do you happen to be so wise you must have assisted your mother in the kitchen she said with a slight curl of her pretty lip up there in the country boys do those things i suppose philip was nettled Ruey had cast little slurs on his country home before, when she got her spirit up. He controlled himself, however, only saying, I don't profess to understand the science of cookery, but I do know a little chemistry, and understand that an acid requires an alkali to neutralize it. Mrs. Thorne went straight to the kitchen, shutting the door after her with the least perceptible bang, and sprinkled a liberal allowance of soda into the batter, and then returned to the dining-room to await developments. These cakes were yellow and spotted, and savoured of hot lye. Mr. Thorne went bravely through a few mouthfuls until he encountered a lump of soda. The wry face that followed was wholly involuntary. "'I declare they are horrid!' exclaimed Ruey, bursting into tears. "'I knew soda would spoil them, bitter stuff!' Mr. Thorne did not then attempt to show why soda would not spoil them, if properly used. Grieved at his wife's distress, and becoming hygienical, he said, "'Don't have anything more to do with these wretched things. They are unwholesome anyway, and we are better off without them. Give them up.' "'Never,' said Ruey resolutely. When Ruey spoke in that way, Philip knew she meant it, and he sighed at the prospect of discordant breakfasts through a series of experiments. A text about a dinner of herbs floated through his mind as he walked abstractedly toward his store. After Mrs. Thorne had dried her tears, she walked into the kitchen, and with her own hands scraped that acid alkaline mass into the drain. "'Buckwheat cakes are very mysterious and trying things,' she remarked to herself but I shall never give up till I can make them like Philip's mother's. I find, said Mr. Thorne that evening, that I must start to-morrow morning for New York, and will need a very early breakfast. Let Joanna just make me a cup of coffee. No cakes, remember, he laughingly added. 
you may have a whole week to experiment upon them in my absence. Ruey watched him down the street in the grey dawn of the next morning as he hurried to the depot, and a bright idea came into her head. Why not take a little trip on her own account? She might run up to Father Thorne's. Why not be visiting as well as moping here alone? She wished she had thought of it and mentioned it to Philip, but it was better not. He would probably have thought she could not go so far alone. But what was a day's journey when it could all be accomplished before dark? Then it was going to be a bright day, she could see that by the rosy flush in the east, just the day for a journey. Besides, Philip could not go to visit them this winter, and how delighted they would be to have her come and break up the monotony of their lives. She glanced at the clock. Only six o'clock. She would have ample time to get ready for the eight o'clock train. The dress she had on would do to travel in. Just slip her black cashmere into her satchel, and she was ready. Yes, she would go. Artful Ruey. Down in her heart she had a secret reason for this visit, that did not come up to the surface with the others. She wanted to know exactly how Philip's mother made those cakes. She could not be happy until she succeeded. Here appeared an old trait of the girl Ruey, almost a fault. Settled persistency in accomplishing her ends, a determination to walk over all obstacles, however large." It took much lively stirring about to accomplish it, but the house was put in order, and Mrs. Thorne reached the depot in time for the eight o'clock train. The happy Joanna, being dismissed to her home for a week, after carrying her mistress's satchel to the depot. Mrs. Thorne had visited the old homestead with her husband at the time of their marriage, and looked forward with real pleasure at the prospect before her. "'Won't they be surprised, though, to see me coming without Philip?' And then she smiled to think how she was whizzing along in one direction, and Philip in another, while he thought her snug at home. There was a spice of adventure about this going off by herself that she enjoyed exceedingly. There is no more delightful place to step into than the home of two old people who are young and who love you. They have their hearts at leisure, can take time to pet you, and are interested in the smallest details of your lives. Philip's father and mother belonged to this type. The juices of their natures were not dried up. They received Ruey with open arms, and followed her about with their eyes, apparently fearing she would vanish as unexpectedly as she had appeared. Philip's wife caring enough about them to come so far to see them in the middle of winter— all alone, too. Not many daughters-in-law like that. They hung upon her words, and brought out the choicest of everything, and urged it upon her. At bedtime Mother Thorne came up to tuck her up, just as I did Philip twenty years ago, she said. Then the sweet old face bent over Ruey's for a moment, and left a good-night kiss, and, The Lord bless and keep you, dear child." Ruey's heart went out to her, and from that hour Philip's mother was her mother. Breakfast was all ready the next morning when she came down, and she sat in Philip's old seat, and the sun looked in at the east window, and a stray ray fell upon her, and burnished the gold of her hair, so that she looked more like an angel than ever to those dear old eyes. How happy they were, Philip's other self in that vacant chair! Moreover, she ate those famous cakes. It was all true, they were brown. They were thin and delicate, and light and sweet and tender, the most delicious morsels with the amber maple syrup that she had ever tasted. She must confess it to herself, they were better than her mother's. City people could not concoct such amazing cakes as these. Then the fragrant golden butter— how she wished poor Philip were there to get some of all these good things. She had not proposed that her mother-in-law should know that there was anything in the universe that she was ignorant of in the housekeeping line, but now she resolved to lay down all her pride and learn whatever she could, so she followed Mother Thorne as she trotted in and out from pantry to kitchen, initiating herself into the mysteries of this and that dish, and storing up many a lesson of housewifely skill. It all came out after a little, the struggle she had been through with those horrible cakes. 
Father Thorne laughed until the tears came to hear his pretty daughter-in-law naively narrate her many grievous failures in that line, enlarging not a little on Philip's wry faces when he tried to eat her cakes to save her feelings. She had confessed it all, now she felt free to watch the process of setting the cakes and to ask all the questions she pleased. "'What made mine so horribly bitter once?' she asked. "'Why, you put too much yeast in, I suppose.' "'I only put in a teacupful,' said Ruey. Then Mother Thorne shook her sides with laughter as she said, "'Why, child, that ought to make cakes enough for two dozen people. You only need about two tablespoonfuls for the quantity you would make. What made them run all over creation when I left them by the fire to rise?' why maybe you didn't have room enough for them to rise and they must go somewhere you know what made them sour they stood too long after they got light before they were baked very likely they would have raised in time if you had left them on the table say what do you do when they are sour asked ruey put in a little soda I did, I put soda in, and you never saw such looking things as they were, yellow and spotted, and, oh, how they tasted! Philip nearly choked himself on one of the lumps of soda in his cake. "'Don't you know,' said Mother Thorne, indulging in another laugh, "'that you must not put in but a little, and you must dissolve that in a spoonful of warm water, and then stir it in?' Ruey studied those cakes as thoroughly as she ever had a problem or a French verb. She insisted on setting them at night and baking them every morning during her stay, and she was finally pronounced an adept in the work. This was not all she did. She put new life in the silent old house, sung all her songs, read the newspapers aloud, made a cap for Mother Thorne, and a marvellous tidy for the best chair, besides telling them all about Philip, as if she could tell them anything new. But the pleasant visit must come to an end. It was almost time for Philip's return. "'Daughter, I am really afraid to have you set out this morning,' Mr. Thorne said, on the day that Ruey had fixed upon for her return. "'It has been snowing hard all night, and if it keeps on at this rate, the railroads will be blocked up.' "'Oh, father, I must start. Philip will be home to-night, and what will he think if he does not find me there?' Ruey said eagerly. "'Better,' said the wise old father, "'better stay and telegraph to Ralph.' "'Oh, no, indeed, that would spoil all the fun. You know I will get home at four, and Philip at seven. I shall have tea all ready and sit there demurely waiting for him, and he never will imagine that I have been off on a frolic until I tell him. And so she started, with many misgivings, however, on the part of the old people. "'She's such a bright little thing,' Father Thorne said to his wife, when they were toasting their feet at the fire that night before going to bed. "'It's like seeing the crocuses and daffodils coming up, or getting a sniff at a hyacinth, to have her light down here like a pretty bird to sing and chatter to us. Philip always did know just the right thing to do. He couldn't have found a better wife if he had searched the whole land through. The train that carried Ruey thundered on its way, as though it disdained the thought that the snowflakes that filled the air could have aught to do with its progress. When the first tiny white feather came and softly laid itself down on the iron rails, did it secretly exult that it was one of a myriad that should rear a gigantic barrier before which this puffing fiery monster should stand powerless and acknowledge the soft bits of down master of the situation? The storm raged through the day, increasing each hour in strength and fury. The long train began to plod in a laboured, tired way after the manner of mortals, stopping often while snowploughs in advance cleared the track. Darkness came down, and still the fearful mass of whiteness piled itself in huge billows about them. The snowploughs were unavailing. As fast as they cleared a place, the wind surged down and filled it up in a trice. The mighty engine struggled in vain to press forward, but only crept at a snail's pace, and finally came to a dead halt." they were fast shut out from the world. They could do nothing but wait for morning. 
most of the passengers might not have resigned themselves to sleep so contentedly had they known that they were in the midst of the woods many miles from any town of much size not near even to one of the straggling hamlets that dotted the country when the morning dawned they found themselves literally enclosed in snow snow above beneath to right to left behind before a beleaguered host those who understood the situation looked appalled the world was well represented here in that restless company that stared from their windows into snow how strange that one particular class did not set out on this journey but each class had its type as if some one had gone about and gathering up handfuls of people stowed them on this train they were all there the woman with five children and the one with a lap-dog and all acted out their individual natures more fully than they might have done under other circumstances. Many lost that reticence that is supposed to belong to well-bred people on a journey, and told out their private affairs. The man of business knit his brows, and said that he must reach C by a certain time, or the consequences would be most disastrous. The fashionable lady wrapped herself in her furs, and bestowed withering looks on the crying baby. The grumbler grumbled, and was sure somebody was to blame somewhere. The funny man bubbled and sparkled as usual, and sent rays akin to sunshine over lugubrious faces. The profane man opened his mouth, and out came toads and scorpions, and the tobacco-chewers made dark pools on the floor to vex the souls of cleanly people. By the close of the day they were a very forlorn, hungry people." There was one among them, though, who seemed to rise above it all, a plain-looking woman with an unfashionable bonnet and a face like a benediction. She drew a little worn Bible from her satchel and read it a while by the dim light. Ruey wondered if she did not get something from that book that made her patient when others were not, that sent her to relieve the tired mother by caring for the fretful baby a long time, and when another, a sad mother, unable longer to control her grief, moaned out, "'My child will die before I can get to her.' This woman was the one who went to her with words of comfort. Ruey's poor perturbed heart envied that calm face. She felt well-nigh distracted, not so much at the fact that she was cold and hungry, but what would Philip think when he returned and found her gone? No one knew where, not even a neighbor had the least intimation of her whereabouts." what a night of horrors he must have had oh to be obliged to sit there and wait when she felt like flying she heard the woman with the bible whisper to the poor mother pray that will surely help you perhaps it would help me thought ruey she was not used to praying but she needed help so she put her tired head down and whispered a request for deliverance what did philip do he essayed to walk into his house. The door was locked, and there was no response to his repeated rings. He tried other doors with no better success. Then he visited his neighbors. They could give him no clue. He came back and stood in a dazed way on his own steps, looking up and down the street. He went down into the town and peered into the stores, but no Ruey. He called upon her most intimate friends. They didn't know she was absent. He racked his brain. Was she out to tea? But she expected him home that very day. As the evening advanced, he began to be thoroughly alarmed. Perhaps she had met with some horrible fate in her own home. He forced the door and entered. The pretty rooms were in exquisite order. He searched wildly about for some scrap of paper that might explain the mystery. Wherever she was, she had evidently been gone some time, the fires were dead and cold. He rushed down into the town again and consulted detectives, who suggested elopement as an explanation, whereupon his anger rose to a white heat, and he left them. Another idea struck him. Joanna must know something of this strange affair. She lived in the country. The polar wave had by this time reached that region. In the face of a blinding storm, Mr. Thorne drove at a rapid pace to Joanna's home. The sleepy girl, when roused, could at first give nothing but an exasperating nix to his eager questions. 
Finally, from her broken English, he gathered that her mistress had gone away on the cars, had directed her to come back to her duties that very afternoon. She did so, only to find the house closed. Here was a little light, but it did not relieve his perplexity. Ruey's father's home was in a distant state. She certainly would not go so far away in the dead of winter. He could recall no acquaintances living near. Had she become insane and wandered away? But she evidently meant to return that day. Why did she not come? Where was she? The cold sweat stood upon his face when he remembered stories of abductions. He went to the depot and remained the whole night, watching the trains that came from anywhere. Morning dawned. She had not come. As a last resort, he would telegraph to his own home. But why would she go there and without him? It seemed a useless thing, but he did it. After an age of waiting, he received answer. Ruey left here for home yesterday morning on the seven o'clock train. He soon learned that said train was snowbound a hundred miles away. His anxiety now assumed a new phase. Would she starve or freeze before he could reach her? There was no time to be lost. Supplying himself with provisions, blankets, etc., he took the first northerly train, travelled as far as he could by rail, then hired conveyances to carry him to where men and snowplows were cutting a road to the imprisoned cars. Mr. Thorne joined them in their work. His strength seemed superhuman. Muscular men were amazed at his swift, dexterous movements. All day they toiled. The following night was a terrible one to the heart-sick passengers. The fires were out, not a morsel of food to eat. Ruey, chilled and weak, could not even find relief in sleep. Her fortitude nearly deserted her. The tears had their way. She lay curled in her seat, a wretched, disconsolate little heap, when a brown-bearded man, muffled in furs, entered, flashing the light of his lantern here and there, eagerly scrutinizing the faces. He paused at Ruey's seat, an indefinable something attracting him, though the face was covered by two hands. Suddenly she looked up, and there were Philip's dear eyes gazing into hers. No questions were asked or answered just then. She was gathered in his arms for an instant, then he wrapped her in blankets, brought food, and nursed the color back to the white cheeks. Then there were long stories told on both sides, and Ruey laughed and cried by turns, and all the passengers were in lively sympathy with the little lady who had found her husband, or rather whose husband had found her. When Mr. and Mrs. Thorne next sat at their breakfast table, it was graced by a plate of cakes that might have come straight from Mother Thorne's kitchen, and some of the home butter was there, sweet as roses, some of the golden maple syrup, too, from the trees Philip had played under, and Ruey sat triumphant with a little air that said, Didn't I tell you I'd do it? Ruey, said Philip, I do believe that elopement of yours paid, notwithstanding the outlay of debts and fears, money and tears, to say nothing of the muscle I put into that huge drift. Ruey knew why it paid, though she didn't tell her husband just then. She should never forget that night, nor the plain woman with the old bonnet who carried the untroubled face and the worn book. Deep in her heart a new purpose had taken root, an ambition not only to make cakes like Philip's mother, but to attain to that blessed something which made this other woman so different from those about her. End of chapter 12